Hey, Just a Car. Um, I watched your recent video about Earl Silverman, and, and I kind of felt compelled to make a response. Um, first, I want to say that Earl Silverman and I were friends. Uh, we met through our involvement in the MRM, and we, uh, we had a lot of long conversations about the problems men face in the current culture and legal climate. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to provide you uh, with a little background on him, what his story is. And I hope I'm getting all the details right. It's a really long, convoluted story with a lot of different players, and I may uh, trip up on some of the small details, but this is pretty much it in a nutshell. About two decades ago, Earl left an abusive marriage, and he sought help within his community. Uh, what he found were services dedicated to female victims and treatment programs for male batterers. Um, it wasn't just assumed that he was the perpetrator of abuse in his marriage. It was considered an impossibility that he could be a victim of female perpetrated abuse. Now, you and I both know what ideology it is that's responsible for that set of beliefs. And uh, I'm not sure you are aware of the lengths proponents of this particular ideology have gone to to suppress any evidence that contradicts their worldview. I do remember sitting in a Denny's one morning with Earl, and he told me that talking to a feminist domestic violence advocate about male victims was like trying to convince them that, quote, this coffee cup is not a blue Mercedes convertible. It's coffee cup. You know, that feminist will even drink coffee out of the cup, all the while insisting that it is, in fact, a blue Mercedes convertible. Uh, he even said that uh, one advocate he was talking to said she would take the word of one woman over a hundred studies showing female perpetration and male victims. What are you going to do? Like a lot of activists do, uh, he kind of saw activism as an opportunity to find healing. Um, healing isn't usually what happens when you do that, uh, especially when your activism encounters brick wall after brick wall. But given the fact that at the time there was next to nothing out there that did offer any kind of healing or support or therapy for male victims, it's hard to find a way to blame him for, uh, for seeing things that way. He started a men's crisis line and a support group, the Family of Men's Support Society, which he operated for 20 years. Uh, he watched very, very closely as researchers and advocates from Murray Strauss to Suzanne Steinmetz to Martin Fieber to Donald Dutton to Aaron Pitsy to e e Eugene Lupri and countless others published survey after survey demonstrating that current official models of domestic violence and current government and community strategies for intervention and treatment were based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem. He watched as a growing mountain of social science research was not only ignored by government agencies and ministries, but actively suppressed. Curious as to how data from Statistics Canada showing roughly equal numbers of male and female perpetrators and victims wasn't finding its way onto publicly funded websites and information sources on domestic violence, he went and did his own investigation into how things work. What he found amazingly was that in Canada, any report on any gendered issue moving from one ministry to another, say from the Ministry of Health to the Ministry of Justice, must first be vetted and approved by the Minister for the Status of Women. If that minister feels that said report would be detrimental to the treatment or status of women in society, the report stops at the minister's desk. So basically, in the Canadian federal government, you have one person who has veto power as to which information and what research and which data go where. In 2004, he began requesting funding for services for male victims from the provincial government. Uh, mainly, he wanted some funding for his Family of Men Support Society. He was denied and told to go to the federal minister for the status of women with further requests. That minister referred him back to the provincial government who told him they didn't fund such services 
and around and around he went between government departments, agencies, and ministries, all of whom claimed that providing services for male victims was not their mandate. In 2006, he applied for a sex discrimination hearing in front of the Alberta Human Rights Council. Uh, his request for a hearing was denied repeatedly. He appealed repeatedly and found himself uh, representing himself against two attorneys, one from the provincial government and the other from the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters. The HRC assigned an investigator, and after four years of looking into things, the investigator returned with a finding that because there was not an equal need for services for men, the fact that no funding at all was granted was not evidence of discrimination, and there was therefore no basis for a hearing. Now, I'm going to share a little background on the Human Rights Council and what a joke it has become uh, to those Canadians uh, in the know. Uh, a journalist and magazine publisher uh, was recently brought up in front of the Human Rights Tribunal to defend his right to freedom of expression and freedom of the press over a decision to republish the Danish cartoons of Mohammed. All of that was based on a single, incoherent, handwritten complaint from a lone Muslim imam. Uh, also, a complaint by a Jehovah's Witness was granted a full hearing after the man was fired for refusing to stock holiday items on the shelves, as was part of his job. This employee was not required to put up decorations, mind you, or wish customers a Merry Christmas, only to stock shelves with merchandise for sale. The HRC is a clearinghouse for often completely frivolous complaints of discrimination. Apparently, the federal and provincial government's refusal to provide a single dollar of funding towards services for half of the victims of domestic violence and their children was considered too frivolous a complaint, even for the HRC. In 2010, Earl finally took it upon himself to purchase a house and run it as a shelter for men leaving violent relationships. He operated it out of his own pocket and private donations, and by having to charge clients $20 per night to cover costs. In 2012, in court again, attempting to be granted a hearing in front of the Human Rights Council, he made a tactical decision he hoped would result in all of this stuff getting on the public record. He made a frivolous threat against one of the two opposing attorneys in a court document he then presented to the judge. A threat that was comparable to, I'll blast him with my phaser. His house was raided, all his computers and documents seized, and he was arrested and charged with extortion. Now, that was what he was hoping would happen. Uh, it was his hope that a criminal proceeding would provide a venue for his experiences to become a matter of public record. That all the evidence not made available to the public because the HRC wouldn't even permit him a hearing in which to present it would come out in his criminal trial. Now, I remember telling him over the phone that the moment this particular attorney realized that that's what would happen in a criminal trial, uh, that the charges would be quietly dropped. And surprise, surprise, they were. Now, just this year, uh, I think it was at the start of this year, maybe the very end of last year, Earl was invited onto a local current events program called Primetime, called Alberta Primetime to discuss male victims of domestic violence and the lack of services for them. Former Edmonton mayor and current provincial coordinator for the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, Jan Reimer, was invited onto the program as well. She declined to appear. Uh, production staff reported that she said, so much as showing up to discuss male victims would only lend legitimacy to the fact that they exist. So, no funding, no hearing, no criminal trial, no public record of his evidence, and no public debate with those who control the money and the dialogue. Just a few months ago, Earl finally found himself too deep in debt to continue to operate his shelter. So he closed it down and sold the house. The day after moving his belongings out, he hanged himself in the garage, and he left a four-page suicide note. Now... I'm positive 
that he didn't take his life because he was depressed. I really, I really don't think that's what this was about. I think he did it for the same reason he made that threat, wrote it on a piece of paper and then handed it to a judge. Because he was determined to get all of this on the public record, in official documentation, even if it had to be through a suicide note published in a medical examiner's report. We'll see if the contents of that suicide note will be made available to the public. I don't imagine they will, since I'm almost positive it named names, uh, unless he mailed a copy to someone uh, who has the, you know, has the desire to make it public. As things stand now, Earl's closest friends and fellow advocates may not even be allowed to know when and where he'll be buried. Shortly after Earl's suicide, feminist Mary Elizabeth Williams published an article at Salon.com disavowing any feminist culpability for his death. What I found most illuminating about her article was that she defended feminism from culpability by repeating the exact same biased and faulty, faulty statistics and the exact same lies about domestic violence that feminist lobbying has managed to institutionalize in legislation and in government and police policy the exact same bullshit Earl ended his life to expose. It was, in essence, an exercise in saying, feminist lies about domestic violence didn't kill Earl Silverman, and I'm going to prove it by repeating all the lies that some people claim were what killed him. You say in your video that it's impossible for Joe Biden to be uh, held responsible for the death of a man who killed himself after being denied funding and assistance from the Canadian government. I suppose that's true enough. He wasn't directly responsible, just like Amanda Marcotte and David Futrell are not directly responsible. But these problems are not just Canadian problems or US problems or British problems. The Duluth model of domestic violence, you know, the model written by feminist academics and activists and which at best describes maybe 20% of domestic violence situations, is the most widely used model in the world. Western governments take their cue from other Western governments. They did this with the Tender Years Doctrine, they did this with women's suffrage, they did this with they do this with all kinds of things. Uh, if the US is using this model, then it must be a good model. This is the model Biden subscribes to with his support for the VAWA, even though he's publicly admitted having been physically bullied and abused by his sisters while he was growing up. Amanda Marcotte, in her book It's a Jungle Out There, claimed the MRM is full of shit because, quote, according to MRAs, if a man bruises his knuckles on your face, then you've both sustained a domestic violence injury. The blog Linear Thinker published a year or two ago an article refuting David Futrell's assertion about assertions about domestic violence and posted 69 scholarly citations that exposed all the guy's lies and misrepres misrepresentations Yet David Futrell still portrays MRAs as a bunch of violent, violent thugs who want to make it, make it legal to beat your wife. It's the ideology that's responsible for the situation that led Earl Silverman to believe killing himself was the best or only way to expose the problem. And every single public figure who's willing to, to knowingly and repeatedly lie about intimate partner violence is partly culpable. Feminists who terrorized Erin Pitsy into fleeing the UK for her own safety because she dared to say that more than half the women seeking help in her battered women's refuge were as violent as their men, and that they were also violent toward their children. The feminists at the NOW conference who listened in icy silence to a lesbian activist who complained that the gendered language of domestic violence law and policy doesn't serve the victims in her community, and who refused to applaud until she had made the addendum that, of course I'm not saying that partner violence isn't gendered. Of course it's gendered. The feminist academics who stood up en masse and walked out on Murray Strauss's address when he was elected president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems, even though his speech that day was primarily about the harms of spanking your children, simply because he publishes research on partner violence that asks men and women the same questions. The feminist grad student and her feminist professor who took data from Statistics Canada showing 601,000 female victims and 585,000 male victims and transformed that data in their report to 1.2 million 
Canadian women. They're all culpable. And the really horrible thing is that the current feminist approach to this problem is not going to stop the cycle of family and partner violence. It really doesn't matter if a kid grows up seeing dad beat the shit out of mom or mom beat the shit out of dad. That kid is just as likely to grow up believing that the way to resolve conflicts with your spouse is to start swinging. More than that, what lesson is a boy learning when he sees his father call 911 for help only to be the one arrested and removed regardless of who was the violent partner and even who was more severely injured? What lesson is a girl learning when she sees that? Now, I'm not one of those people who thinks there should automatically be an equal number of beds and equal public spending on services for male victims. Even if there are an equal number of male victims, men and women are going to, you know, generally speaking, respond differently to partner violence and require different supports and assistance. It's entirely possible that because of general personality differences between men and women, men will not utilize domestic violence services to the same degree or in the same way women do. That's all fine. But, in Alberta, there are at least 619 publicly funded beds for women. And there are, in the province, in total, two beds, I'm not sure whether they're even publicly funded, for men. Both of them are in Strathmore, which is so small a community, I couldn't even begin to tell you where the fuck it is on the map. Elsewhere in Alberta, and in the rest of Canada, men with children leaving an abusive spouse face the wonderful option of leaving their children in the sole care of a violent woman or risking a child abduction charge. Official acknowledgement of and services for male victims might mitigate that risk and remove both men and children from terrible situations, but as it stands now, the male perpetrator-female victim paradigm informs all the responses of police, the court, and government agencies. In fact, the system currently provides abusive women an additional weapon, the system itself, to bludgeon their male partners with, if they so desire. False and frivolous ad allegations of abuse enabled by a system based entirely on feminist ideology allow women to batter their partners by proxy using the police, the courts, and the family law. Every single person who supports this bullshit is a little bit culpable, not for Earl's death, because that was, in my opinion, his own decision. A final strategy that might work where even getting himself charged with extortion hadn't. But for a system that justifies its own continued existence by perpetuating rather than alleviating the cycle of family violence. You claim that holding unrelated people such as Biden, Marcotte, and Futrell accountable for Earl's death, even metaphorically or rhetorically, is a logical fallacy and itself indicative of ideological thinking. I have to say, I'm not really fond of that kind of hyperbolic rhetoric myself. But consider that the Minister for the Status of Women has every legal right to obstruct the flow of information within the Canadian government if said Minister feels that information would negatively impact Canadian women. The White House Council on Women and Girls exercises similar power, as does the Women and Equalities Ministry in the UK. How the fuck did we get to this point? Who is responsible? And is the mere act of opposing an ideology and holding it accountable, even hyperbolically, for actions performed in its service and naming its biggest and most dishonest proponents while doing so really evidence of ideological thinking? Frankly, if a man wrote in his suicide note that he chose to end his life specifically to draw attention to and raise awareness of a certain issue, well, what would you have the rest of us do? This is not a man who killed himself because of depression, despair, frustration, or feeling he'd been treated unfairly. It isn't just sad. He killed himself specifically in the hope that it would get something done. Regardless of whether you like the rhetoric of those who are taking what he gave us and running with it, what else would you have them do? He didn't want us to quietly grieve his death, to be sad and get together and commiserate over a few drinks. He wanted us to do something with it, not respecting that wish would be dishonoring his memory. I knew him well enough to know, even without what little of his suicide note has been made public, that his decision to commit suicide was a tactical one, not an emotional one. Once he saw himself as no longer useful to the cause as a living advocate, he did what he had to do to make himself useful to the rest of us.
was a ruthless and calculating decision with a specific goal. His way of taking a final stand, of saying, this far, no further. And I would be very disappointed if MRAs didn't extract every drop of benefit they could out of it. This was a man who was willing to risk going to prison just to get his struggle on the public record. And I'm not going to go so far as to claim his sacrifice in hanging himself was selfless or noble. But I will say it was an act of neither cowardice nor despair. I'm going to repeat, Earl didn't kill himself because he was depressed or dis disillusioned or disappointed or discouraged. He killed himself so that others would climb on top of his body and use it as a soapbox to continue the efforts that were most important to him. If he was committed enough to do that, it's unfair to criticize MRAs for doing exactly what he wanted them to do, exactly what he died so they could do. How fair would it be to Earl, a man who ended his own life for the sole purpose of furthering his life's work, if we were to do our grieving quietly and privately and pretend that doing what he wanted by exploiting his sacrifice was somehow unjust or unseemly. And I know you're coming at this from a position of not really knowing the whole story, not having been aware of all the stuff I've talked about in this video, and not knowing Earl. Which is why I'm not annoyed with you for accusing a voice for men of capitalizing on a tragedy or exploiting victimhood, or of being dishonest, illogical, or ideological. There's really no way for anyone not intimately acquainted with this particular situation to know all of this, precisely because the system has been so effective in keeping all of it under wraps. Earl signed every email with the phrase, live for nothing, die for something. He did die for something and the MRM is only honoring him by keeping his death from becoming just another one of those 58 million people who die every day, essentially for nothing. And for Earl. I'm just going to lift my blue Mercedes convertible here and uh, take a drink in his honor. In his honor and uh, in the hope that he didn't fall on his sword for nothing. If there was ever anyone I would have called a one-man army, he was it. And he was one with whom no one who mattered, not even the great Jan Reimer, Edmontonian of the century, recipient of a Governor General's award, was willing to publicly engage in debate or in battle. Earl, oh, he lived for nothing. He died for something, and uh, I'm going to miss you. And uh, to Justicar and the rest of you, see you.